wonderful occasions of the church, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, also called the Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. And we have so much to be thankful for because of Jesus Christ. Um, in preparation for this, I would like to read an excerpt from a classic on holiness theology, and it's called Pentecost, and this is by J. Bryce, and there's a chapter in that book referring to the filling of the Holy Spirit and maintaining holy living, and it's called the Perpetual Discipline. And Bryce cites means of grace being the way for disciples to maintain the way of holiness. And he identifies the following ordinances to help us maintain a Holy Spirit. Prayer, scripture, the Lord's Supper, and fellowship with other believers. And I have this quote from the part where it talks about the Lord's Supper as a means of receiving the grace that God has for us. Here's what it says. As to the supper of the Lord, the saints of old said, it is a spiritual feast to nourish our faith and to strengthen us in all holiness by Christ living and walking in us. The sacrament has affected sainthood more int intimately, more vitally than any other means of grace except prayer. It holds within itself peculiar values and vitalizing powers for the nourishment of the soul. There in Calvary is not only perpetually commemorated, but mystically renewed. Time sinks away, and Calvary is now. The atoning act is contemporary with the suppliant's need. It is present, actual, and immediate. In this mystic moment, temporal but eternal, the saints renew the bond of their covenant, rededicate themselves to be a reasonable and holy living sacrifice and replenish their souls from the innumerable benefits by which his precious bloodshedding of the saints is valid. Here is the chief sustenance of sanctity. Let us pray. God help us to receive the benefits of the love of God expressed in the sacrifice of Jesus in this moment afresh and new. May our consecration or commitment or devotion not be something that happened many years ago when we first saw the light of the truth of Jesus, but may it be active in this moment today. May we apprehend the grace you intend, God, when we experience in a mystical, spiritual, intangible way the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you and for me. The blood of Jesus brings us forgiveness of sins. Will you come and take and eat and drink and have your souls be nourished by the spirit of the living Christ?
invite you to come. Scripture reading this morning is taken from Acts 8, chapters 26 and 39. <clears throat> uh, you can follow along on page 1149 in your Bible. Philip and the Ethiopian. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, and then go down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch and an important official in charge of all the treasure of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near to it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading his passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as the lamb before the shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with the very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water, why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. I got a question here, Brian. Uh -huh. yes. How come there's no chapter 37, no verse 37? They left it out. Well, some Please tell us, all-knowing. Some manuscripts add 37, and some manuscripts lack 37, where it talks about he believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Why did they leave it out? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I shouldn't ask that. I'm sorry, I shouldn't ask that question. <laughs> Oh, I thought about that all night. <laughs> okay, and why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all of the towns until he reached Assyria. This is the word of the Lord. There's a wonderful website called Desiring God. And if you ever want to get a real sense of the life of the Spirit, uh, it always has truth and it always shares it in such a positive way. Well, from that website, Desiring God, I read this. God uses his people to do the humanly impossible. If it's impossible, wouldn't he use someone other than a human? He doesn't. You and I can be instruments or agents or vessels that God uses to touch, influence, and impact people all around the world. If I will say yes to God, it's amazing the opportunities that I will find. The next phrase says, when that happens, when human people do the humanly impossible things, God gets the glory. And then it says, life is a series of never to be repeated opportunities for buying up spiritual blessings. Whether we are on course or on a detour, every hour of life brings a spiritual situation that can be bought up for eternity or missed. There is never a dull or insignificant moment for the Christian who is radically devoted to purchasing life's little moments 
for eternity. Well, Luke traces the actions of the Holy Spirit um, in, in the book of Acts. And we've already seen the Holy Spirit invading Jerusalem. And then we see it focusing on Peter and John and, and their ministry. And then we see uh, last week that, that, that one of the Council of Seven, Stephen, stood up and he proclaimed um, the good news fearlessly and it ended up with him being stoned to death, but he realized that this is what his life was for. And he died with a, with a joyful, his face looked like an angel, and, and he said, Father, forgive the people who are doing this. If they understood, they wouldn't. And how powerful we see that. And then from Stephen's death, something new happens. The church is persecuted in a big way. And people in Jerusalem who have been going to the temple to worship all the time now flee. Some go north, some go south, some go east, some go west. But wherever they go, they bring their joy and the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ to new places. You see, those who were persecuting them, now including Saul, who was the one holding the coats uh, of, of the people who were stoning um, Stephen, these people who were persecuting them, they were intending to eliminate the Jesus followers. And instead, they disseminated the message that they were trying to contain and erase. It's the work of God. It just is. How powerful. You know, if, if you want to squash a tomato to slaughter it, and you do that, the tomato flings everywhere. <laughs> well, thus happens with the word of God. So Stephen died, and as a result, the message went out further. Remember Jerusalem and Judea, and now Stephen was one of the Council of Seven. The second person in the Council of Seven noted is Philip. And when Philip leaves and runs for his life, guess what? He goes to Samaria. Samaria? Samaria getting the good news of Jesus Christ? Philip was a man that allowed God to do whatever God wanted to do with his life. And no doubt being filled with the Holy Spirit, it was, it was the Spirit of Christ that put a thumb in his back that if you've got to run, run to Samaria. Samaria, those people are the enemies of any good, respectable Jewish person. Samaria was, um, was or they, they, they originally were part of the northern kingdom of the Jews. There, there were 12 tribes. The northern kingdom were 10 tribes, and the southern kingdom were two tribes. Well, the northern kingdom was less faithful to God faster, and they turned from God, and they turned to idols and other things, and so they were, they were um, destroyed before the southern kingdom by the Assyrians. Well, when the Assyrians came in, they planted themselves in different towns in Samaria. Samaria was more than a city. It was a smitty, sit, city and a, and, and a like region. But these Assyrians came in and, that, and they intermarried with these formerly Jewish people in the northern tribes. And then they were, they were introduced to worshiping more than one God and that kind of thing. So the Jewish people who thought they were so pure 
In the southern kingdom, by the way, they weren't. They also, they also uh, uh, needed to be disciplined and exiled and everything. But they would look down on the Samaritans. And yet, here, the Holy Spirit is saying that you cannot contain the truth of God's love. And so, so when everyone scattered, Philip went to the enemies of the Jews, the despised. There was a lot of prejudice. And that's where God seems to have sent Philip. And um, so he goes to Samaria, and he, he not only tells them about Jesus, but when he sees a need, he prays for people, and they are healed, and that brings more and more people to care and to listen and to be drawn to the power of Jesus Christ. And now, here's, here's something. One of the, the first convert in Samaria mentioned by name is called Simon Mag, Magus, or, and it means Simon the magician, Simon the sorcerer. Samaria had a lot of darkness. Uh, they, they, there was a lot of demon oppression. There was a lot of satanic influence. They, they were people who, who, who had turned from God, and yet they wanted spiritual power, and they found it often in putting faith in people who were like Simon. Well, Simon had great power. Some people thought of him, he was like a celebrity, you know? Uh, uh, and and, and they, they were like all stunned with him. But when Simon saw real power from Philip to heal and help people, he was impressed. Somehow he saw that what, what Philip has and what I have, it's not the same thing. And so Simon... Um, wanted to find out more and follow, and he was actually baptized as a Christian. So now all these people in Samaria are finding Jesus, and so Peter and John leave Jerusalem to come up to validate that this is actually what the Holy Spirit is doing. And they laid hands on these believers and prayed that they would fully receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in people in dramatic ways responded. And, and, and so, so Simon said, wow, not only does Philip have this power, look at Peter and John. They're, 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 like, they're, they're like a rock star. I want what they have. So he said, hey, Peter and John, I want to buy what you have. And Peter was like furious. What do you mean you don't buy spiritual power? That's not how you get it. Well, he said, you're wicked that you think such a thing. And I think that Simon simply only knew one kind of power. And he was not, he, he, he was like, he was like, well, I don't understand. And he said, pray for me that I will receive what you're talking about so that I understand I can't buy my way into position or office. By the way, in the Roman Catholic Church, when early on when they sold offices to people for spiritual authority and it was part of the kind of corruption they call that simony after this scripture so anyhow how unusual that someone who who was so familiar with satan's power would see the real thing not the counterfeit but the real thing and be drawn to it I think this tells me that when someone comes from an, a background where, where they know darkness primarily, 
that yes, we need to confront them. And yes, we need to help them along and not assume that this everything will automatically fall into place. We've got to invest in discipling them. That's okay. But to assume that, that, that God is just going to come in someone's life and they don't need instruction is just not accurate. So we see here what an odd, odd beginning in Samaria. Not some righteous person, but someone who, who is drawn by the power of God even though they know the power of darkness. So, that's story number one. The second story is about the Ethiopian eunuch. So, that all happened, and Philip hears from the Holy Spirit. Unmistakably, very specifically, I want you to go down the old desert road to Gaza. Now, there were two Gazas a new Geza and an old Geza. And I th- believe this was kind of the one that you wouldn't, wouldn't expect. It, it's, the, it, it's like, who travels that road anymore? But the Holy Spirit said, go down that road. So Philip went down that road and he saw one, um, one person. And it was a, a guy from Africa, Ethiopia, And he was somebody who looked very stately. And he was on a chariot. And probably there was a driver and everything. And he was going down. And he had a scroll that he was reading. And he was reading out loud. Well, the Holy Spirit said, run up beside the chariot. Now, Philip was a man who knew that God was in this. So he was willing to be a fool. So he runs up beside the chariot and he looks over and he says, "Uh, what are you reading? And he stops the chariot and he invites invites him up and he, he said, well, this is what I'm reading from Isaiah. And, and he said, well, do you understand it? And he said, no. I can't understand it unless someone explains it to me. Well, by the providence of God, the very scripture that he was reading was a prophecy about Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God. He was going to be the sacrifice. He was going to suffer from Isaiah chapter 53, one of the most beautiful passages about the Messiah being suffering. The Jewish people always thought the Messiah would be a king and everything would be great. But Isaiah 53 reminds us that this savior would come and suffer and die and sacrifice himself for the benefit of others. So it says, beginning with the scripture that he was reading, Philip brought other scriptures in to help him to understand that Jesus is the Son of God. And here they were kind of in the desert, and there was some piece of water. And so, um, so, so the eunuch said, hey, uh, let me be baptized. And Philip thought, there's no reason not to be. Now he could have said, oh no, you're black. Oh no. You're from another country. Oh no, you're a eunuch, which means you're castrated, and that means that you're unclean. He said none of those things. He joyfully said, here is a person who has been a seeker, who has now found life. And so he baptized him. And when the eunuch came up out of the water, there was great joy. And all of a sudden, the spirit snatched Philip away. They never saw each other again. But that official from Ethiopia went and introduced Christianity to northern Africa. 
Amazing. How God used one Philip to impact Simon, a satanic influencer. And this person from the royal court, probably the treasurer of a country. It's amazing. So let me say this. Our joy reaches its fullest extent only when it is compounded by the joy of seeing others share it with us. Our goal in evangelism is to be God's instrument in creating new people who delight in God through Jesus Christ and who thus bring us great joy. May you bring the joy of the truth of the love of God through Jesus Christ wherever you go. Set the world on fire with the love that God has put in our heart. Lord, we've experienced your word today and how it has the power to change the direction of God-fearers' lives or people who have been sold over to Satan. We have experienced the wonder of the table where we, in a fresh, new way, experience your love in sacrificing Jesus Christ. And we have experienced the presence of your spirit, which can communicate with us how to best be instruments to serve you. We thank you. Bless us as we go into our mission fields this week. In Jesus' name, amen.